we can see the importance, the central importance of the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve also shows up as imbalances as something I've been studying for several years. It's been, it shows up as what in somatics, the system of body exercise called somatics, shows up as what's called the red light reflex, a tension in the whole front of the body that comes from stress. When we talk about some of the solutions to help to activate and heal the vagus nerve, we will be talking about also certain kinds of exercises like somatics and some others that open up the front of the body and release the tension from that area. And some of that has to be releasing the tension from the back because the stress affects both the back and the front. So uh, with that, uh, depending on questions, I may add some more information, but I would just ask people if they stay muted uh, until you ask your question, and then when you ask your question, please unmute yourself and then ask your question and mute yourself back up just so we get away from the background noise. Okay, so I just want to ask if you had any questions before we start with any other information, just in case. I have a question, John. Hi. 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 Um, so you mentioned uh, the vagus nerve can it affects so many, many things. And you said cholesterol, uh -huh. uh, also high cholesterol. My doctor just told me my cholesterol is 299. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if I were to, I know you're going to talk next week about activating the vagus nerve, but is there mm -hmm. something I can do now to bring that down to what many would consider a acceptable level? without the drugs that he wants me to take? Sure, sure. Well, you know, there's some evidence that it, there's no risk for heart disease with that as much. Uh, the issue more is that, and it's not related to food directly. It's related to food that if your diet becomes imbalanced, it can raise your cholesterol, but it's not related to cholesterol and food at all. So when you eat cholesterol, it's, it's basically, it's not related to any cholesterol in food. Your cholesterol, even though doctors don't really study nutrition, but it's not related to cholesterol in food at all. Zero relation, that's proven. What it means is that your body is overproducing cholesterol in the liver. That's why it goes up. So you should not really like cut out cholesterol in food or lower cholesterol in food. That's not the solution because that could make it go, it, even if it lowers the cholesterol, it could make your overall health worse. So the, the key is to get your body out of the stress mode because the body is operating in a stress mode. So you have to find out what the body is doing to make the stress mode. But there is you know, something that tends to, there's two, a few different imbalances. Um, stress hormones are made out of cholesterol. That's why when the cholesterol is high, it means your body's in the stress mode. So adrenaline and cortisol are made out of cholesterol. So when your body is basically in the stress mode, it starts to produce more cholesterol to deal with the stress. The problem is it shouldn't be in the stress mode too long, otherwise it starts to burn out the body. So one, of, one simple thing to do, and we can talk about more things later, is there's an herb called reishi mushroom. And reishi mushroom has been found to lower the cholesterol, and I think one of the ways it works is by getting the body out of the stress mode. Another herb that does that uh, and helps counter the sympathetic activation of the overactivation of the sympathetic nervous system is rhodiola. So that would be worth taking also too, like reishi and rhodiola. And then it, it's important that your diet, uh, you know, you look at things like in your diet and lifestyle that would cause stress. You know, we can have medication stress. You could have, if your diet is too narrow or too, too much processed foods of any kind, it can both cause stress. So we have to look at, to make sure that you're not trying to eat too narrow or trying to eat too many processed, or not eating processed foods. So you should really cut out, you know, sugar and processed foods if you're having any of those because that will put your body in stress. Also, you should cut out polyunsaturated fats, even healthy ones like safflower oil, sunflower oil, nuts, seeds. We should oh. have them 
Why you, you, should cut, you should cut out safflower oil, sunflower oil, um, not seed, any polyunsaturated fats. But you want to look at also, you know, just look at your diet closely for stress that you're not, you know, eating too, you know, making it too narrow. Um, sometimes we can talk about that, you know, separately too. So, but those, uh, but you have to get the body out of the stress mode. That's the main thing. Okay. Did you see the, the reishi and the rhodiola in tincture form? Uh, you can take it in tincture form, but uh, not alcohol tincture, or you could, it should be a concentrate, even if it's in a powder in a capsule. It's best if it's a concentrate, not the pure herb, because it's not digested well. You have to have it. Okay. Like reishi mushroom has to be boiled. If you had a reishi mushroom around the house, you know, just in case, um, you have to boil it like for four hours. So it's best to get a concentrate in a capsule or if it's a non-alcohol tincture, you know, in this case. Can you yeah. heat it with hot water if it's alcohol or no, it's still not good? It dissipates some of the alcohol if you put it in boiling hot water and let it sit for a few minutes. But there's a lot of good forms where you could do that. I could send you one if you want, but just let me know. So. I've got... Uh... What's that? Yes. Yeah, if as long as it's a good quality, you know, it's, I haven't... I don't know the bottle, but I don't know the brand. So. Oh, you don't? Oh. Okay. I guess well, I guess the real key is to be able to identify when your body is in stress mode. Um, well, yeah, and, and, you know, and you know, you can tell when our bodies are in stress, but how can we identify if we're not getting enough sleep? If obviously, if I feel sick, I know I'm probably in stress mode, but right now I feel great. Right. And uh, I have a really good diet, I think. But well, you know, that'd, be, that, that'd be something that, you know, we could talk about, you know, that, uh, and maybe we could talk about individually. I give you some suggestions individually because it's uh, it's a more specific to deal with a person. Yeah. For instance, for instance, if a person just examples of this before we go on is that someone uh, healthy fats are very important, and the most important fats are actually saturated, whether it be from vegetable fats like coconut oil or or butter or some other or in food, because they get you out of the stress mode more. So if you're not eating enough of those, that, that could be sometimes an issue. That could, you have to do some investigation to see which of the things that you're doing that could put you in the stress mode with your diet. So that's why it would take more like a individual investigations. Yeah. Uh, you have signs that you're in the stress mode. Your body has signs looking visual from my diagnosis, but that we'd have to look at more specifically. Good question there. Thank you so much, John. And thanks we'll for doing these. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, sorry, we're going to get, we'll work out the glitches for next time. Well, I think this time now. So, okay, so any other questions that you have? Yes. Lisa, yes. Hi, good to see you. And thanks for the Hi. seminar. Oh, um, thanks. I have, I have celiac and Hashimoto's, and um, <clears throat> my, my voice does get hoarse. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm wondering what's the cause and and how to get rid of it and it's you know it fluctuates it's been fluctuating for years as a matter of fact um, when I called a bank they actually had voice identification system and did not recognize me so rejected my call from from vocal um, voice ID so I'm wondering what I can do about that well that 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 is really going to be the uh, you know not to put off your question but that'll be really the uh, the that's the lecture next month. So we'll be talking about not only how do you activate, how, how to activate the vagus nerve. Uh, there'll be particular practices I'll be talking about, but I'll also be talking about how to get your body out of the stress mode because the vagus nerve is generally weakened. It's because the vagus nerve is part of the parasympathetic branch. It's really more related to the parasympathetic the non-stress mode of your body. So then it's basically how to get your body out of the stress mode. So it, I'll be talking about particularly, you know, uh, surprisingly some things that people don't realize in diet that's putting them under stress. Even natural diets, particularly natural diets. There are natural diets that are more experimental, like, like vegan diets or close to vegan diets that can put people in the stress mode if someone wants to do that, there has to be some juggling 
of how they're going to get themselves out of the stress mode because no group in the world ate that way. So it could put a lot of people into high stress mode. And then also there are things that you can do to, uh, to get the body out of by releasing that tension in the front of the body. Uh, there are some herbs that get the body that calm the sympathetic nervous system. So, um, you know, two of the ones, the rhodiola that I talked about uh, when Suzanne was asking that question is one that would be worth looking into. Uh, and then next month I'll be talking about a lot of things that people can do because I'll be talking about all the things that put the body in the stress mode that deactivate the vagus nerve. And, uh, you know, then uh, basically, you know, the old, the old joke is, uh, you know, if you, if you want to get, um, if you want to do something, don't do the opposite. So you have to do, you know, have to get out of all the things that are putting the body in the stress mode and then work on activating. One of the things you might look into even before that on a physical level, there's this system of exercise called somatics by Thomas Hanna. And that's very good to release the front of the body, you know, where the vagus nerve and uh, each exercise is done for a couple of weeks at a time. And, uh, but if you wanted to work on just the fake, this part of the body in the front, you do the first and two lessons. So uh, maybe the rhodiola would be a place to start and the, the somatics, if you're not doing it, at least those two. And then next month I can talk about more. Okay, any other question about what we talked about? Yeah, can I ask you something? Yes, I I'm the key. Hi, thank you for your uh, great seminar today. Um, you know, I had a two question, quick question. Uh, first one is the, uh, the what's the relation between the uh, uh, vagus nerve and the adrenal gland? No, no, the dysfunction of vagus nerve and the adrenal gland fatigue. And the second question is the, uh, uh, how long does it take for average person to get back to, you know, healthy autoimmune function if chronic stress is over 15 years or something like me? Right. Well, you know, there, there's the, the connection between the adrenal glands and the, uh, the connection between the adrenal glands and the vagus nerve is that the, organs. So the adrenal glands control the autonomic nervous system is a major gland that moderates, modulates the, uh, the vagus nerve and the nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. So there are hormones that basically, hormones are chemical messengers and the adrenals produce hormones that calm down and activate the parasympathetic nervous system. And then they produce other hormones like adrenaline or epinephrine and, and some others that activate the nervous system and activate the sympathetic branch to put out energy and use up energy. So what happens is when the adrenals are weak, the adrenals are a strange organ in that when they're weak, they can still spike the stress organs. They can still spike into the sympathetic mode, into the stress mode. So it's by strengthening the adrenals, uh, basically they start to basically regulate the nervous system better between the parasympathetic and the basically the sympathetic nervous system. So it, it can take, the, uh, to understand how long it takes to heal the adrenal glands, it's important to understand that the adrenal glands are probably related to what in Chinese medicine or the Taoist, old Taoist medicine is related to the kidney energy or the jing, the internal, the deepest internal energy. So that of all the organs, the adrenals take the longest to heal. Um, and we're talking about two, three years to really recover. And, you know, by diet, by lifestyle, there are certain kinds of practices. One of the most amazing practices that heal the adrenals is, uh, standing and sitting meditations. Mm -hmm. uh, but sitting meditations that are very particular that focus on breathing, uh, mm -hmm. what they call kidney breathing, which is abdominal and back breathing. 
And then standing meditation with alignments. There's very specific standing meditation because these ones strengthen the parasympathetic nervous system. And there'll be some of the ones I'll be talking about next month too. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you for the question. Any, yeah, thank any other questions we have? Uh, hi, Jen. Yeah, hi, Christine. Hi, oh. Christine. Hi. Uh, is this lecture that you just gave available, will it be available on your website or no? Yes. Well, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier uh, for people who came in late that I'm going to work on editing, editing the recording and adding to it a bit because of some of the glitches okay. we had and putting an ending on it. Uh, and if uh, and I have to listen to the recording to make sure it just came out. If it came out basically okay, then I could probably edit it and add, take out some things and add some things at the end for finishing. And then if that, uh, if that comes out fine, then I'll put it on to my. Okay, okay. I missed, unfortunately. Um, but I wanted to also ask you, are you doing Zoom consultations or in-person consultations? Okay, I'm sorry. Before, I just wanted to mention, uh, if you're not signed up on the email list, uh, they will be sending a, we'll be sending, if you don't have an email, one of our emails, just sign up and uh, if you're not on our email list, then we'll send you a link uh, when the recording is done. And what was the second okay. question? I'm sorry. Uh, do you take in-person consultations or just Zoom or? Yes, there's some in-person in consultations, yeah, with safety, you know, being safe, you know, taking cautions. Okay. We do, I do that too. Um, so I've done some okay. of that. And is that in Connecticut or? Well, right now I'm not traveling to places because uh, it's just hard to go to certain places. So uh, it's usually in Massachusetts, you know, Western Massachusetts. Okay, because I'm right. thinking this of my, nine, my 90 year old father who lives near Hartford. Oh, right? okay. So you're okay. a Massachusetts. Yeah, Western okay. Mass. So okay. it's the Western area, Western, Western okay. Massachusetts. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I think Hi, this is Lynn. That... Um, yeah, Hi, I had Lynn. a question about, uh, uh, let me, I'll turn my video on for a minute so you can see me. I'm outside. So um, oh, okay. my question, yeah, my question, um, okay, my question was about the gallbladder. You said, I thought you said, uh, if you're having a problem with the gallbladder, says you need more fat, which confused me because I always thought you needed less fat because your gallbladder digests fat. Maybe I heard you wrong or I don't know the right thing. I wanted to clear that up. Sure. Well, what happens is that when you don't eat enough fat, that happens the gallbladder uh, gets more stagnant. It also puts the body in the stress mode. So um, because your body needs a certain amount of fat to function, all the healthy cultures that were studied around the world uh, by people like Weston Price and some other people who went to traditional people, they always ate a certain amount of healthy fats and particularly some natural animal fats. And what happens is when you don't eat fat, the gallbladder, the body can go in stress. So the gallbladder becomes sluggish but also it doesn't function. So it functions when your body eats fat. So you need a certain amount of fat to prevent gallstones. And even to help, uh, there are other things that help to dissolve the gallstones, but, the, uh, but it's not necessary to go on a low fat diet uh, for, for those conditions. I haven't seen benefits. But, but fat, that. Mac macrobiotics has traditionally said don't eat coconut oil. And now everyone says it's such a, like the really high qualities are really good. And, well, so, and we can keep going about different kinds of fats. So what is your current today, 2020 belief about sure. what fats are good for you? Sure. Well, you know, I've, I've created something from my, I talked this about this experience before that people were getting sick, some long-term teachers on vegan diets. And I started to study traditional eating and realized that traditional cultures always ate both vegetable and animal food. They were valued. So I came up with an approach that I explain on my website called the Full Spectrum Macrobiotic Approach, where I recommend people eat both vegetable and animal quality foods, and that they take coconut oil as well as, uh, as natural butter and some other natural saturated fats. Coconut oil, 
I think in general, it's still a good idea to follow the balance with the environment. Coconut oil is unique in that it is not a choline food compared to like coconut or bananas or other tropical foods. It basically balances the body temperature and has amazing health benefits. Uh, traditionally, the interesting thing is macrobiotic eating recommended a lot of foods that were from more warmer climates like rice and uh, for people living in colder places. But I think coconut oil would be something that would be benefit because it doesn't have a cooling effect, so it can be fine for cold climates too. Well, thank you, because I know that MCT uh, powder and oil got me off of caffeine. I was, after my mother died and I was like, you know, around the clock not sleeping, I got addicted to caffeine. And then when, I, for some reason, if I would take that MCT oil or powder of high quality, it would, it would make the headaches for the withdrawal go away so I could tolerate it and then I got off it. Yeah, that and other saturated fats have amazing health benefits. I, I explain uh, about my adjustments and what I do on my website, macrobiotic.com. So if you just check there, you'll see um, what I'm talking about. I, I will. Thank you. This is really elucidating. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay, we have a few more minutes. Any other questions? Hi, Jen. I have a question. This is Pam. Um, Hi, it says Pam. under Mary, but this, sure, this has sure. been fascinating. I have a question, and I don't exactly know how to ask it, but um, I, I, I did some tests, and I may have like a deep-seated virus, um, and I don't know if it's really showing up or not, and you mentioned the exomes. So I don't know how to, um, what's the best thing to clear that out, or how do you know when you really have a virus? Okay, well, you know, there is, uh, you know, the, uh, I would look at, you know, there are some, um, in a future lecture, I'm going to be talking about some ideas, alternative ideas to things like the germ theory, virus theory, all these theories, which are basically, you know, theories of medicine and science. And, uh, so basically, you know, there are people who believe that, uh, that viruses might be exomes and they have a beneficial effect to the body unless the body is very sick. And then they could cause problems with the body because they are trying to actually heal the body, but the body is so sick it could cause some damage. So um, I would look, you know, I think I would look into, you know, more into that idea. Maybe send me an email and I can, uh, I, I can, you know, give you some ideas about where you can look to understand more. I think that would be the best thing to do. When you say look to understand more, what do you mean exactly? What's that? You said send you an email just talking about what's going on and, um, and, and I'll give you some references, some references where you can learn more about those distinctions so you can figure out okay. uh, how to approach that. Okay. Do you explain what an exome is on your website? I haven't yet explained what an exome is, but it, uh, that's something for probably another time to talk about. Uh, it's a kind of a big thing to explain. But uh, Thank you. That, that would probably, you know, I wanted to do something in the future on germ theory and uh, those ideas around that, and then I'll be talking about that. It's a little bit of a big area to go into for now uh, in five minutes. Um, so I would have to, I think yeah. I'm going to have to wait on explaining about that. Sure. We don't have anything That's yet on it, but I'll, I'll do something yeah. soon. That would be great, thank you. Because I, I, I think I've heard of most things that I haven't heard of that, so it's weird. Yeah, it's a new area in the last years, um, but there's been, I guess, some understanding of it before that, but now it's being studied more. Hi, John. I uh, hope you and Jeanette have been very well the last few months. Uh, good to see you. Yes, yeah, good uh, to see you, Michael, or good to hear you. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have. We I'll have. Turn on, I'll, I'll turn on. I'll turn on my camera shortly. I didn't want it to fall on the recording. Um, so my question um, is about knowing when your vagus nerve is healthily functioning, that it's restored, so to speak. If you did, if someone were to do work, and the few things come into mind is if someone's 
thinking, uh, you know, they're mentally sharp, uh, their bloods are coming back well, they generally feel well and healthy, and say their libido is in full swing. Are those like enough um, to kind of draw the conclusion that one's vagus nerve is strong, so to speak? Or like, what, what, what are some indicators that someone's in good uh, standing? Well, you know, I was going to talk more about that next month, but I'll just explain, you know, some things. Um, you know, if you can, you know, if you have like, a, if, you, if you swallow well, you know, a lot of the things about the vagus nerve is uh, that you can understand are also if you don't have stress responses. So, so basically, if you don't urinate excessively in the day, uh, that's a sign your body's not in a stress mode, so your vagus nerve is most likely good. Uh, I'll talk about you know some of the symptoms of dysfunction. Also, if your breathing is deep, um, it's good. You know if your if your body is not forward bent, then the vagus nerve should be in good shape because it means you're not in a stress mode. Uh, what you talked about libido is one thing. Uh, digestion also if your digestion is good. Uh, if your blood pressure is good, uh, also. It shows that you basically, uh, if you if the, your vagus nerve is in good health, um, if your appetite is just a good stable, uh, that will show that your vagus nerve is good. If you tend to have on blood tests good blood sugar levels, especially the A1C, which uh, is important. Um, if your bowels are fine and you tend to digest your food well, these are just some of the signs that your vagus nerve is functioning. Now, um, I would also add to that coloring under the eyes because this is in the traditional oriental diagnosis shows the condition of your adrenals, kidneys. So if you have any black or purple under the eyes or bags, it can indicate a possible vagus nerve dysfunction because, of, uh, because your body's in the stress mode. 